Have you ever wondered how a psychologist feels during their sessions? Having people dump on them all day makes them feel? Do they avoid feeling their clients' emotions in order to, you know, keep their own, but in turn would this make them a worse therapist? How does a client's suicide affect them? And how do they cope with all of these facts? The crazy thing about researching a topic like this is there's obviously so much research on the mental health of all kinds of patients across all spectrums, but there seems to be little or inconclusive evidence when it comes to those conducting research on like psychologists who are most directly affected by the mental state of their patients. I wanted to be clear that I'm not an expert in this field and I'm just interested in these topics and have done a lot of research, but I'm not a qualified psychologist or anything along those lines. Now, this is a broad topic, of course. Every psychologist is different and therefore will have differing views and mindsets. However, using studies, articles and written interviews, I have found reoccurring themes, thoughts, techniques that can determine the psychology of psychologists. Now you may think that a therapist is a master of their own feelings, a wizard of emotions, but in actuality, they are people trying to better themselves and just get through life as well. Dr. Hayden Finch wrote, the fact that someone can share their deepest insecurities and their biggest mistakes with me and I still have positive feelings towards them shows just how worthwhile they really are. Surprisingly, most therapists say that they just want to be there for their clients and listen to them and help them in any way they can. Um, yeah, like I said, most say they just want to listen. Dr. Anita Sands reflects the thinking of many psychologists when she tells us that during the sessions, they are conscious of their own feelings, but need to make a judgment on whether it would be helpful to share their feelings or not with their client. When she is sitting down with a client, if their reaction and feelings don't align with what they are saying, this lets them know that there is something that needs to be explored further during their next session. She says there's something powerful in that. This tells us that most psychologists uh, need to be conscious of what their clients are thinking, whether it is what they're uh, saying or reading a bit further into their emotions and how it is affecting them. They, they do this whilst remaining impartial and keeping in mind what is best for the client. Another important part of their job is as they are listening, they need to be mentally connecting a client's words with previous comments they've made, their facial expressions and behaviors in order to detect a pattern. These all conjunct into one of the most important parts of therapy, which is determining what a client needs, which may not align with what they want. If a client isn't making progress in their own time, a clinician will allocate time towards determining what needs to be done differently and how they can work towards their client's goals. Uh, which is the main purpose of therapy? To achieve a client's goals, whatever that may be. Another thing I found interesting is that psychologists need to pay attention to the time and subtly manage it properly in a way that you can still share all you need to, but also be pieced back together by the end of the session. The goal of being a therapist is not to judge or to categorize someone, but to understand that person as an individual, so that he or she feels seen. To imagine people without their defenses or labels put on them by their family or society. This unique perspective enables a therapist to offer a genuine reaction to their clients and doesn't reinforce their old definitions of themselves. Dr. Lisa Firestone. When asked about the mental impact of being a therapist, former psychologist Elliot Huang says, if you're surrounded by people in pain all day, you need to strike a balance between being compassionate and being negatively affected by other people's suffering. This sentiment is reciprocated by many therapists within the industry and proves to be a huge challenge. Another former psychologist, Rick Cornier, talks about the unhealthy ways to practice psychotherapy. I've known therapists who talk about their cases at the dinner table, like photo gossip. They get wrapped up in their clients' lives, and those are the ones that tend to burn out. He went on to give an example and an explanation for the reason he doesn't like to work with kids. Unlike adults, kids would listen to the advice he gave them. He'd lose sleep over kids. Whereas an adult would take the advice or leave it. It's their life. If I'm not aware of this, worrying about a client, then there is a danger that I try to fix things or cease to be a therapist and start to become a friend, which is not helpful and is often when abuse in therapy occurs, as the therapist fails to maintain proper boundaries. Karen Pullock. Countertransference is a concept that seems to be inevitable for any psychologist that's been working in the industry for a notable amount of time. This is when a psychologist transfers their emotions from their own lives onto a patient. Psychologists talk about emotional distance, balancing genuinely caring for their clients, but not getting too invested, with most recounts emphasizing the importance of remaining objective within the industry. 
This is more commonly known as a working relationship. In 1981, a publication was released uh, about therapists who are treating Holocaust survivors. Uh, a man named Yayu Deli, I could have mispronounced that, wrote this publication tell telling us um, that many therapists were experiencing nightmares matching the patients they were treating from the Holocaust and feeling physical reactions such as vomiting or fainting from hearing about these terrible stories. It got to the point where the therapist was scared of meeting with the clients and not to the fault of the clients, but because they were scared of their own reactions to the content they were hearing about. Later, mirroring results were discovered with therapists treating victims of the 1995 Oklahoma bombing survivors of Hurricane Katrina and sexual abuse victims. Uh, Jackie Burke, the clinical director for rape and domestic violence in Australia, talks about vic vicious trauma, which is very similar to secondary trauma. Um, she tells us that it's almost inevitable within this line of work. Through a combination of tactics that I will cover later, they are able to navigate and be effective when practicing, which will not only benefit themselves, but their patients. They need to strike a balance between being caring about the person, but still remaining objective. Dr. David Rowland, who's experienced secondary trauma firsthand, talked about coming across the work of neuroscientists Tani Singer and Olga Klimetsky, which noted that a different neurological pathway is activated in the brain during the empathetic response to someone's emotional pain. When a compassionate attitude towards the other's pain is taken, then they concluded that if practitioner channels the compassionate part of their brain rather than the empathetic, the practitioner can feel the client's pain and stay motivated to alleviate the client's suffering, but not take out on the physical or emotional part. Therapists who do experience secondary trauma tend to burn out more emotionally and physically. A lot of these therapists talk about not getting too attached or taking on their client's pain so that they can live a more fulfilling and stress-free life for themselves. Uh, while this does seem logical, it does bring up a lot more questions. Is this going to prevent them from connecting with their clients, thus making them a worse psychologist? As they will not be as actively involved in what their clients are saying, will this prevent them from giving strong advice in the short term? It seems obvious in the long term, of course, as Natalia Perivala puts it, a therapist who genuinely cares is automatically too invested, which spells a lack of objectivity. I think it really depends on the therapist here. I think they're really self-aware and conscious of whether they're being too close or you know what is beneficial to say to the client. I think that is when they're a good therapist. I agree with the sentiment, but Natalia here is implying that many, her and many other therapists do not care about their clients. Um, and if they did, that would make them worse at their job. If a psychologist client were to commit suicide, what impact would that have on the clinician? Suicide is a multi-determined event and it would be unfair or irresponsible for me to imply that one individual thing could cause any one person suicide. According to Segun in 2014, effective treatment for suicide requires technical competence and a wide variety of skills which are rarely covered in most psychology programs. This lack of training can cause self-doubt and anxiety among psychologists um, and can cause them to actively avoid these kinds of patients. The list of reactions to a client's suicide detailed is as you would expect, stress, grief, guilt, etc. However, what I find interesting is that Sedgwin talks about traditional therapy and treating a suicidal patient as two vastly different things. As their goal switches from finding their goals and achieving them like we were talking about to keeping the person alive through connectedness and giving of self and of course being careful of what you say. There also doesn't seem to be many guidelines on coping with the aftermath of a client's suicide. Essentially, across all the studies I looked at, uh, the psychologist's suicide rate was the same as the general public, meaning that the job doesn't seem to make you more likely to commit suicide. Furthermore, most of the psychologist's suicides were said to have happened because the therapist was troubled or distressed rather than in trouble, like they owed someone money. The NIH.gov raised an interesting question that more research should be put into whether already vulnerable individuals choose psychology as a profession. Although it is just a question and there's no real research to back it up, it does really seem to make sense to me. Vulnerable people would choose to help other vulnerable people rather than start with themselves. 
Self-care and self-awareness are essential in this field. And without it, it's impossible for them to do their job correctly without being dragged into the massive black hole before them. I think self-awareness is a skill that everyone should develop so they can view themselves without their own judgments or biases. You can see why it is way more important for mental health care professionals so that they can remain impartial for the sake of themselves as well as their clients. The most effective ways to deal with this is, like I covered before, with being more compassionate rather than empathetic. In this way, therapists can use compassion rather than empathy so that they can identify, understand and feel motivated by a client's suffering, whilst not taking on the physical or emotional components of the pain. The most common sets of values I found within my research were being non-judgmental, listening, knowing they can't fix the problem, being there for the client, and compassion. Therapists need to employ self-care and it seems important that they also go to therapy where they can unpack and deal with their own feelings. I think further training could help if they are dealing with suicidal or other kinds of clients that are out of their depth. The best way for a therapist to deal with the stresses of their job is to go see a therapist of their own, talking of course in confidence about their clients or any stresses that they are dealing with. I think I've provided a small glimpse into a psychologist's world. But of course, only a medical professional truly knows how to operate within this field. I think the problem is that like all of these methods are great, but there doesn't really seem to be any thought, formal structure or support to actually help these psychologists who need it. These people are what help millions of people every day through listening, advice or a shoulder to cry on. And yet, who's there for them? This video has been like insanely hard to make. I mean, I've got like 10,000 words of research on it. I've tried to just cut it down and make it, you know, as entertaining or at least interesting, you know, for a YouTube audience to digest. I think it's really fun. I'm really chuffed now that I've finished this. I've created, you know, I've covered the three main topics of the channel I wanted to cover, which would be film, basketball, well, sport, but mostly basketball psychology, which is obviously this video. I know it's not like the traditional way to build up a brand or the most effective way on YouTube, but I just don't really care. I just want to make videos about topics that I'm interested in. And I'm sure other people are going to be interested by these topics, even if they, you know, tune in for the film videos and then different people tune in for the other ones. I think it's going to be fun. I've got so many ideas, like great video ideas um, written down. I just need to actually get onto them and make them. And I think, yeah, this is going to be awesome. awesome Awesome year for us. Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate all the support on my Marvel video and the subscribers and I'm really going to try and go hard on this whole YouTube venture.